Thank you all for joining us today. This is the second session of using UN Biodiversity Lab to support national conservation and sustainable development priorities. My name is Amber McCullum, and I will be your presenter alongside some great guest speakers today. Throughout this series, and for the various languages, we will have different speakers. Today, we will be joined by Annie Vroong and Scott Atkinson from the UNDP. For this training, we will have three one and a half hour sessions. We had our first session last week on March 24th, and um, today's session March 31st, and our final session will be April 7th. We are presenting the same content in three different live sessions in English, French, and Spanish. Note that you only need to attend one session per day. You can find all the course material on the website listed here, and after each session, we will have the questions and answer portion. Feel free to type your questions into the chat box along the way, and we'll try to get to as many as possible at the end of the webinar today. We will also post the questions and answers on our website after the training. If we don't get to your question and it's not posted on the website, you can also email myself or my colleague Juan Torres Perez at the email address listed here. For this training, we will have one follow-on homework assignment, and that will be available on the course website. This will cover content from the lectures, as well as from the exercises on the UN Biodiversity Lab Mapper, which we will highlight throughout this training. To receive credit for the homework, you must submit all answers via Google Forms by the deadline. And that deadline is Tuesday, April 21st. And you will receive um, access to the link for the homework by the end of next session. So by April 7th, you should see the link to the homework, so you'll have two weeks to complete it. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend all three live webinars and complete the homework. It takes some time to process these certificates, so you can expect to receive them about two months after the completion of the course. The only prerequisite is the fundamentals of remote sensing, shown here, or the equivalent experience. Again, you can find all the course, course materials on the website listed here. This includes a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation in all three languages, a link to view the recording from each week's webinar, and you'll be taken to um, our YouTube channel to watch that, and a link to the Google form for the homework submission that will be available next week. Here's an overview of the course. Today, we will focus more specifically on the UN Biodiversity Lab and the data sets they have available in their web tool. In the final week, we are going to hear from the user community in a series of country-specific case study examples. Today, we will begin with an introduction to the UN Biodiversity Lab, and then you will be guided through some key features like how to register, search, and visualize data. We will discuss how to conduct analyses, and then we will step through an exercise on how to create a map. At the end of the session, we, as we have with the others, we will hopefully have time for question and answers. So now I'd like to hand it over to our guest speakers today, Annie Vernig, Knowledge Management and Technical Capacity Building Specialist at the UNDP Global Program on Nature for Development, and Scott Atkinson, Spatial Planner for the 6NR to the Convention of Biological Diversity at UNDP. Great, thanks so much, Amber. It's great to be here again today. So building on our webinar from last week, we're excited to offer you a training on UN Biodiversity Lab. Just to give you a brief outline of our time today, we'll give you about an hour and a half long training in four main sections. So we'll start out by providing a recap of the main features of UN Biodiversity Lab that we covered last week. 
We'll also go over some of the key data that's available through the platform. After this, we'll jump into the details. We'll show you how to register on UN Biodiversity Lab, search data, and visualize multiple data sets. We'll then show you how to use the platform to run some basic analyses. Finally, we'll wrap up with some commentary on how UN Biodiversity Lab might be able to support your needs. All right, let's get started. So as you might remember from last week, we created the UN Biodiversity Lab in 2018 to support governments in their conservation commitments. The UN Biodiversity Lab is a free, open source platform that provides policymakers in 137 countries with access to the best spatial data and analytic tools, regardless of their GIS experience. So who uses the platform? Our first use case focused on supporting countries to prepare their six national reports to the Convention on Biological Diversity. Through this work, we have over 200 policy relevant users from 60 countries who are active on the platform. UN Biodiversity Lab also serves as the official de decision support system for our NASA Forest Integrity Project and Life on Land Project. And finally, anyone can access UN Biodiversity Lab and take advantage of the resources we have available through the platform. Since the site was launched, we've had over 23,000 views of the public facing side of the site. As we move forward, our goal is to build on our policy relevant user base to support other key actors to take action for nature, climate, and sustainable development. So before we dive into the details of the training today, I just want to go back over the five key features of UN Biodiversity Lab that I highlighted last week. First, we provide access to over 100 global data layers on biodiversity, protected areas, and sustainable development available through the public side of the site. Second, the platform provides priority access and the ability to visualize all of the data from our NASA supported projects that I introduced last week. Third, we offer the ability to conduct basic analyses without any GIS experience, create beautiful maps for download, and finally, you can use the platform to view story maps that communicate stories of conservation success in a wide range of countries. We'll go over all of these features in more detail throughout the rest of the training, with the exception of story maps. I also want to note that we recognize that many of the countries that we work with have national data that is often higher resolution and better suited to national needs than some global data sets. For the governments that we support directly, we've created private workspaces called national projects that enable them to upload their national data and analyze them in combination with global data sets. However, as we're focused on a broad audience today, we won't go into the details of these private workspaces. However, Scott and I are more than happy to discuss more with any of you who might be interested in this feature and to see how we might be able to support your work. Please don't hesitate to contact us after this or raise questions during the Q&A session. Uh, you'll find our email addresses at the end of this presentation. All right, so with that, I will turn it over to my colleague Scott to introduce some of the key global data layers we have available through the platform. Over to you, Scott. Thank you very much, Kathy, and good day, everybody. So let's first dive into the global data layers that are available on UN Biodiversity Lab. For the purposes of this training, we've divided the data into four main categories to give you more of a sense of the types of data you can find on the site. The categories I'm going to be going over today are protected areas, biodiversity, threats, and sustainable development. And I'll also briefly be touching on data available through our NASA Forest Integrity Project. So first, 
data on the global protected area states. We can't really talk about conservation without mentioning the main policy tool that policymakers reach for, which are protected areas. So let's go through a few of the key protected area data layers available on UN Biodiversity Lab. First of all, of course, is the World Database on Protected Areas. It's the largest database of protected areas on the planet. The data itself includes the legally defined protected area boundaries as reported to them by governments for both marine and terrestrial realms. We pull this data in directly from UNEP WCMC in Cambridge, the same people that produce protected planet as well. So the data in UN Biodiversity Lab is constantly updated whenever UN, uh, whenever the WDPA is updated in every, every month. We also have data on a recent analysis published in the journal Science that provides an estimate of the management effectiveness of protected areas globally. Here, this data represents the percentage of protected areas that are under intense human pressure or have been converted from natural land cover types to human dominated uh, land cover types. Some of you may be aware of the PAM or PAME uh, database, which is the Protected Area Management Effectiveness database being produced by UNEP WCMC. However, it's important to note that this database currently doesn't have a common metric of how effective management actions are in addressing the purpose of the creation of a particular protected area. Uh, for example, was a protected area created to protect a habitat or a species or a landscape, et cetera? So without such a common metric, we might be looking at proxy data sets that can help us measure some sort of effectiveness. So how well is management reducing loss of natural habitats in these PAs, for example? Uh, in this case, we might be making the assumption that if management is doing a good job, we shouldn't be losing natural areas. We shouldn't be getting a loss of these natural habitat types to human-dominated types. Or on the flip side of that, if management is not doing a good job and it's insufficient, we might expect large amounts of, of habitat conversion within protected area boundaries. So it is important to note when talking about this particular data set, and to avoid any confu confusion and claims on the data, it is not a direct measurement of effectiveness, um, and it may be inappropriate in certain cases. We also have data published in 2017 by scientists of the Joint Research Center of the European Commission that's analyzed how well connected the protected area state is within ecoregions globally. Some of you might be familiar with this data set. It's just commonly referred to as, as the PROCON data set. Next, we're going to move on to a few of our key biodiversity data layers, both marine and terrestrial. We, of course, include the terrestrial ecoregions of the world. Uh, note that the, the, the version that we have on your Biodiversity Lab is the updated version in 2017. Uh, for those of you who are working on the Convention on Biological Diversity, this is one of the key data sets that's directly re referred to in, in some of the specific IUG biodiversity target protection commitments. We also have data in ecological land units or the world ecosystems data. Uh, around a 250 meter global resolution, these data are able to show ecologically meaningful differentiations between habitat types as they account for the ecophysiographical variables such as precipitation or landform type, soil cover, uh, land cover, et cetera. So these are really getting into a higher resolution definition of, of habitats and ecosystems on the planet. So we think before about the ecoregions, it's a, it's, it's a fairly coarse scale definition of ecoregions. And a lot of ABT targets are centered around that. However, as we get down to these higher resolution, more meaningful differentiation between habitats, things like the ELUs, the ecological land units, and the world ecosystems should probably start playing a, a larger role in this. And just for an example of, of how improved this data set is over something like ecoregions, if we look in the image here, On the image that just popped up on the right-hand side, you can see within those black lines, those are the ecoregion delimitations, delimitations. And behind that, you see the different colors. Those are these world ecosystems within uh, in East Africa. So you can simply tell by looking at this image that there's a much higher number of 
world ecosystems or these, these ecological land units that there are ecoregions within within the country. So it, it starts really getting at, at protection targets for unique and, and distinct habitats and ecosystems, more so than we'd be looking at with some of these coarser level global data sets like uh, ecoregions. We also include several other products derived from IUCN Red List range data. Some of these include species richness data, which is shown on the figure here, threatened species richness, um, and several metrics of range rarity, which are measures of, of species endemism. Now, we haven't forgotten the marine realm as much as we can. It's critical to think about marine diversity and wilderness as well. Uh, to the left, the image on the left, you can see a globally defined wilderness areas in the sea. Um, it's important to note that wilderness is increasingly becoming recognized as a conservation target that deserves more attention within, within these global conservation commitments. Uh, in the marine space, we have data on species richness as well, range rarity, proportional range rarity. Uh, of which has been extracted from the Aquamaps tool, which is a large scale prediction of probability occurrence uh, within the marine realm. Um, generally accepted that it produces better, more robust distribution models than IUCN data. For example, the map on, on the right is uh, approximately derived from proportional range occurrences for around 25,000 marine species. Third, let's move on to a snapshot of the available data on threats to biodiversity. First, we have the Biodiversity and Tachnus Index, which you see on the left. The Biodiversity and Tachnus Index shows the modeled average abundance of originally present species within a grid cell as a percentage relative to the abundance of species within an intact ecosystem. It can be seen as a measure of how humans have impacted the terrestrial environment, or equally, Bit of a measure of how degraded the biodiversity in area is compared to how it would be in a natural state. We also have data on the cumulative human impact in terrestrial ecosystems, the Human Footprint Index, along with changes of it from 1993 to 2013, which you see on the right. And in the marine realm, marine realm we also have data on the cumulative changes of human impacts of, of stresses including shipping pollution, runoff plumes, and a plethora of other related data that go into these composite data sets. Finally, we're going to briefly touch on what we're calling SDG data on your biodiversity lab. This data can support actions that deliver across the CBD, the UNFCCC, and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. A key component of this SDG data are socioeconomic data. So there are many socioeconomic data that are available, ranging from human population uh, data to predictions on urban extent and urban expansion, livestock densities, agricultural suitability presently, and predicted changes. Um, and in the map shown here, access to cities in 2015. You might be thinking, what, is, what does that really have to do with, with anything? This data set was originally created out of a project coming from the University of Oxford to measure access to healthcare as part of a malaria eradication project. So this data was intended to help identify at-risk populations in areas that wouldn't have access to, uh, to healthcare. Of course, from a conservation point of view, this is also important to know because it may play a role in being able to map risk to resources. For example, where is access easy to protected areas? It might encourage illegal deforestation or poaching, and that might have impacts upon management effectiveness or where the risk to vulnerable species by poaching might be greatest. Also critical for drawing connections to SDGs are assessments of ecosystem services, such as carbon storage and sequestration. We include several recently available data sets on carbon, including above forest above ground forest biomass, which is globally shown here, uh, soil carbon, soil organic carbon, both globally and within mangrove forests, as well as changes within carbon biomass.
I'm going to pass this back to Annie in a second, but first, finally, I just want to highlight data we're producing with several World Cast research partners through a NASA Force Integrity Project. These data are also available through the UN Biodiversity Lab. I'm going to pass it back to Annie now. Great. Thanks, Scott. So I'll just quickly go through a few of the data layers that are available or will be coming available through this project uh, for those of you who might be interested. Great. Thanks so much, Scott. So last week, I introduced a little bit about our NASA-supported Forest Integrity Project and Life on Land Project. And today, I'll go into a little bit more detail about the different data layers that we're producing through the Forest Integrity Project. Five out of six of these data layers are already available for use through UN Biodiversity Lab, and the sixth will be available in the coming months. So let's jump in. The first set of data we make available through this project is on forest condition. This is generated by Dr. Matt Hansen at the University of Maryland and includes information on canopy cover, time since disturbance, and canopy height. You can see all of the particular data products listed in the bottom right-hand corner of this slide. The second key data layer the project is working to produce is an updated version of the human footprint. This is produced by Dr. Oscar Venter at the University of Northern British Columbia and Dr. James Watson at University of Queensland and Wildlife Conservation Society. The human footprint is a key measure of human pressure on the landscape. And this project is working to update it to provide data layers for the year 2000 and 2013 to allow assessment of change in human pressure over time. Now, Dr. Andy Hansen at Montana State University is working to bring together the data from the Hansen Lab and from Oscar and James at University of Northern British Columbia and University of Queensland to produce what we're calling the Forest Structural Condition Index. So essentially what you need to know here is that a high forest structural condition index can help you to identify undisturbed areas that have high stature and high cover. Conversely, low structural index values indicate areas that are low in stature or recently disturbed. Forests with high structural condition can support high levels of biodiversity and ecosystem services and thus are highly relevant to conservation planning. Dr. Andy Hansen is also working to produce a forest integrity index, which combines our maps of forest structural condition with the human footprint index. So basically forests with high integrity have high structure and they also have low human pressure. So this metric can help us to identify the last of the wild's forests that have high conservation value. So the fifth data layer we have available through the project was developed by Scott Getz and Patrick Jantz at Northern Arizona University. So this data layer looks at forest fragmentation and connectivity across high integrity forest patches. So these data can help you to identify isolated patches, core areas for connectivity, and edge forest, among a range of other factors. We have one more data layer that is forthcoming in the next few months or so. This data set will look at the impact of forest integrity on key species. So basically, this evaluates biodiversity responses to human footprint, connectivity, and forest integrity. So this analysis will look at ranges of individual species, as well as aggregation of key species. And we hope to have this available by the middle of this year. This will also be added to UN Biodiversity Lab and will also be available to help action at the intersection of science and policy. All right. So now that we've given you a little bit of an overview of some of the data sets that you can access through the platform, we'll jump in 
new, actually using the platform to visualize these data and run analyses. So we'll start very basic with registering. So on this slide, you can see the homepage for UN Biodiversity Lab, which is accessible at www.unbiodiversitylab.org. The preferred browsers for the site are Chrome and Firefox. To register or log in for UN Biodiversity Lab, click on the icon as you're seeing in this slide and enter your email address. You'll receive a one-time use code via email. To keep your information secure, you'll always log, log in to UN Biodiversity Lab using this randomly generated one-time code. You should receive an email straight away from the Mapex bot. If you don't receive it within a few minutes, check the spam folder of your email. So once you get the code, enter the code into the website and you are officially logged in. Each time you enter the platform, you can click the icon to see if you're still logged into your user account. You may need to re-enter your email and generate a unique login once again. This generally happens every week or two, um, and so for sometimes you may remain logged in through multiple uses. One thing to be aware of is to be sure you always provide the same email in order to access the projects or any settings you've configured on the site. So as I mentioned before, we created private workspaces called national projects for each country we supported during the sixth national reporting project. These national projects are managed by an administrator from each country who has the power to grant access to new users working on related projects to support implementation and monitoring of progress towards the goals of the Convention on Biological Diversity. The link you're seeing on this screen takes you to a list of administrators. If you're working with government or UNDP, you may want to request access to join your country's national project on UN Biodiversity Lab. This will enable you to gain access to any national layers that have been uploaded already and to connect with colleagues working on similar issues. To do this, navigate to the My Projects button in UN Biodiversity Lab. When you click on the My Projects tab, you'll be directed to a list of projects within UN Biodiversity Lab. Any project you're a member of will appear at the top of this list. You can search through projects by typing the name of a country and request to join from here. This will send an email to the administrator of the project. If you need assistance connecting with the administrator for your country, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or to Scott. Our email addresses will be at the end of this presentation. All right, so with that, I will pass it back over to Scott to talk a little bit more about searching and filtering and running analyses on data. Thank you much, Annie. So whether you're working in a country's private project or on the public site, you can search and visualize data in a few easy steps. We'll explore here a little bit about the types of data we have available on UN Biodiversity Lab, how it's organized, and how you can visualize it in your own national projects. So let's start with discussing by discussing the data types that are available on UN Biodiversity Lab. The UN Biodiversity Lab handles two main types of spatial data. It's vector data, which are data types that include points, lines, and polygons, as well as the multi-feature types, as well as raster data. For now, the important thing to remember is that in the left-hand panel, where you have a list of data sets, vector data types have green buttons, and raster data types have purple buttons. So you see the little red buttons, those don't fit into either a, a, a purple or a green category. Well, those are custom code types. And so those are data sets, for example, such as the World Database and Protected Areas that we're pulling in directly from protectedplanet.net. So you can think of vector data as data that 
represents linear or aerial features on a map, such as highways, or be lines, cities. Those are points or species, so range map polygons, for example. A vector data will normally contain not just a feature on a map, but will also have other data associated with it. It's often found in what's called an attribute table. Uh, that's uh, similar to something like Excel that you might be familiar with. And attributes themselves can be many things, such as place names, areas of features, uh, other calculated or derived data that is associated with the feature. For example, in the images you're seeing in front of you, looking at Ecoregions 2017 dataset in the U of Biodiversity Lab, there's an attribute for each feature called Ecoregion. So it's a finer land classification, as well as a biome classification, which is a more generalized land classification that you can see when you click on a feature in the map. So as, a, as I mentioned, attribute tables are effectively no different than a spreadsheet. Unique data records are often, often called a feature, exist in rows in a table, and each column in the table represents a, a variable and the value of it for that feature. So it's just, just like operating on any Excel document that you might be familiar with, or, uh, or for example, if you manage your, your own bank accounts in some sort of Excel document, you, you might find this very similar. For those, uh, this data can then, of course, be filtered by creating simple queries. Uh, for example, we might only be interested in particular areas that are, that are larger than 100 hectares, or, and the categories here, we want to know areas that have a value equal to extremely high or greater. So raster data is broadly thought of as data that represents things that exist on a range of values across space, such as maps of temperature, land cover, population density, percent of canopy closure of forest, just as a few examples. The attribute of raster data is a value within a pixel. Sometimes that pixel is called a grid cell. And that data can represent categorical values, such as a land cover classification, where a value of one may represent forest, a value of two may represent an urban area, a value of seven might represent some other agricultural value. Or that data can exist upon a continuous plane, so continuous variables such as elevation data or, uh, or rainfall gradients. So within UN Biodiversity Lab, users are able to make maps using both types of data. However, at present, users can only carry out more geospatial analyses and query data by attributes on vector data. Data sets are organized thematically in the UN Biodiversity Lab in two ways, by Aichi Biodiversity targets, as well as general thematic area. So for example, in the APT themes, we focus on Aichi targets 5, 11, 12, 14, and 15. And general themes include things like biodiversity, climate and carbon, ecosystem services, human impact, land cover, marine, natural hazards, protected areas of restoration, and socioeconomic types of data sets. Now it's important to know we've assigned themes to each data set based on our best judgment of the primary categorization among the themes mentioned above both generally and within the context of reporting to the IEG targets. However, you might find that a particular data set may help you in reporting a different way that we've tagged it. And we do and hope, we do hope indeed that, that you will find novel uses to data and that can really assist you in, in answering the questions you have. So there are several ways to filter your views and search for a particular data set within your biodiversity lab. You can search by using a key, uh, keyword, that in here, for example, biodiversity. That will filter our views related to biodiversity. And we can click on the filter activated views button and that will reduce the number of views listed to only those that have actually been turned on, making it a lot easier to view the few data sets you may have turned on at a particular point amongst all the, all the many others that exist. You can also use the advanced fil filter button to search for views by collection types. Now, collection types are both collections identified by us and as well as collection types that can be identified by users within their own project spaces.
If you want to find data from the NASA Forest Integrity Project, you can do so by clicking on the Advanced Filter tab and selecting Forest Integrity Project data. And once this filter is activated, only available data related to that particular collection is going to be visible to you. And we're looking at Global Forest Cover, for example. So whether you're working in a country's private project or the public site, you can search and visualize data in a few easy steps. We're going to explore here a bit about the types of data we have available, how it's organized, and how you can visualize it in your national project. So to activate a data set, turn on a particular theme or target of choice by clicking on the associated switch in the left-hand panel, and you'll see a list of the views related to that theme or target. Simply clicking on them will activate the view. And then simply clicking on the button again will turn that view off. For those of you familiar with the, with the GIS interface, this is pretty standard. To view a map in full screen, it's possible to both turn off the list of views itself, allowing you to view the, the map a bit more clearly, or you can simply remove the panels altogether. So feel free to experiment in clicking with these buttons. So to reorder the views you have displayed, you can either click on, the, uh, click on and drag a layer to relayer it, or you can right click on the view and select several options such as move to the bottom or move to the top. So you might want to do this where you have a preferential view that you want to put one view over another. In this case, we want to see uh, range rarity maps on top of another feature. It allows you to layer views and view them in a way that allows them to be created in a visually pleasing way, makes them easier to see. So finally, we're just going to introduce you to how you can run basic analyses and download maps from your environment to lab. Calculate the area of a particular data set. We offer an area calculation tool. At this point in the time, the tool is only available for vector data. Over in an example you're seeing on the screen in front of you, we're calculating the total area of protected areas in Peru using the January 2019 version of the World Database on Protected Areas. Calculate area, we click on the toolbox icon and we'll open up the, the dialog window that you're seeing in front of you. Select the area intersection tool. We can select layers by either selecting the source name of the data set, or we can select them by using the view name. It's probably preferred to use the view name because those are likely to be something more meaningfully set out. And then we simply collect, calculate the area of intersection. Now note that this says the calculate the area of intersection. And in fact, we're calculating the total area of data layers that we've selected. So in this case, what's actually happening behind the scenes is we're calculating the intersection of protected areas within the country of Peru. So this might take a little bit of time, depending on the layers that, that you have intersecting. Hopefully it doesn't take too long. But it will pull you out numbers both as in square kilometers and in square meters. And if you follow the logs, it will tell you how the process is going. You can also quickly highlight the area of intersection of multiple vector layers. However, at this point of time, this tool is only available as well for vector data sets. Vector data sets. So to do this, we're going to click on the bullseye icon in the top of the screen. Next, we're going to click on the toolbox icon, and under select highlight mode, we can select the number of layers up to five currently that we want to know where they overlap, meaning that if we have two different views turned on, again, two vector views, and we want to know if they if they intersect at some point. We can simply set that to highlight zones where at least two layers overlap, and it will show us pretty much instantly the areas where that intersection occurs. And you can use the tool to estimate the area of intersection here, but we know it is scale dependent and therefore it's not exact. So this is a tool meant for speed to identify areas where intersection does occur, it's not a tool meant to identify the exact areas of intersection between layers. We do have a precise intersection tool available for that, though, in the private project spaces. 
Um, so if you're using this in the public platform, you won't be able to access that. But we also have a click to create polygon tools that enables users to create new points lines of polygons. And you can use the tool to create a click to create polygon tool, for example, to identify the area of new projects on restoration or a proposed protected area or potentially crop lands that are being placed under better management. You can also download the polygons you create in the same way you can download other vector type data sets into one of many common desktop JS compatible standard formats, such as Esri shapefiles, or geo packages, or GeoJSONs, et cetera. Finally, the Map Composer allows for creating high quality maps for inclusion in reports or websites. So to use the Map Composer, we load the data of interest. Next, we're gonna click on the map icon in the toolbar. We can then drag the dimensions of the map to fit our needs. For example, if we know it needs to fit into a particular document or a particular space on our web page. And the legend of metadata for the data layers that are shown will be included automatically. You can simply resize and place them within the map composer to suit your needs. You can change the size of text. You can increase and, and decrease text size and styles. You can make them bold. As well as you can also remove elements. So for example, if you don't want to include all the metadata, you can simply erase it or you can remove it from the map composer itself entirely. You did that by simply dragging any of the unwanted items off to the side of the composer, off of the, off of the map template, and they won't be included in the output. So the formatting of the output of the map composer can be adjusted to, to fit your particular needs. For example, if you need to fit into a standard A4 document or for a web page, and you can adjust these by, by you can manage these by adjusting the DPI as well as the dimensions. So before exporting your beautiful map composition, which of course is beautiful, why wouldn't it be? You can preview it and it will to see what it will look like first. And this will remove the boundaries of the various bits of data that exist in the composer layout, which are there to aid you in distinguishing between different components of the map. For example, the boundaries of the legends are removed in the text, and legend areas appear then as a single continuous block. So if you're happy with that, you can then export it. It will download to your computer. The vector data can be downloaded by clicking on the download button along the bottom of the view that you're looking at. You can select the output format that you would like. Again, this is possible in several common desktop JS standards, as your shapefiles, for example, or geo packages. You can select the country you want to clip the data to. So note this is pre-populated the country of the current project that you're logged into. And you can remove this to download the full data set. However, this might itself result in very large data sets that are very slow to export. But it may be desired if you're wanting to work with data that you've uploaded to your project space, since you may not want that data itself to be clipped to the national boundaries that UN Biodiversity Lab uses. So downloading raster data is possible at present, but it does require a more complex process of building a URL request from our geo server. Mm -hmm. So this may not be the most user-friendly process. It's certainly possible. And if you would like to have some help with it, we're more than happy to assist in doing so while we work out a more user-friendly uh, interface for this to occur. Uh, again, please feel free to email me, Scott Atkinson at scottatkinson at undp.org if you want more information on that in particular. All right, now that all of you have knowledge of what UN Biodiversity Lab is, we want to turn you loose to do a short exercise. If you're joining the webinar with members of your team, feel free to work together as a team. So what is the exercise? Well, we want you to use UN Biodiversity Lab to create a map of the World Database on Protected Areas and Forest Connectivity in your country. We're gonna give you a few minutes to work on this. All right, so are you needing some more guidance? Well, here's, here's a few little recommendations for some steps to follow. First of all, we're gonna load some of the forest connectivity data. Secondly, we're gonna load the WDPA. So this might be just terrestrial protected areas, or this might be marine protected areas, or it might be the full WDPA, that's your call. 
Also, don't be afraid to experiment with turning on and off satellite base maps. Sometimes this might make things look a bit nicer. Sometimes it might make things not look nicer. But experiment with it. And then step four is open up the map composer and set up and creating a map that you think looks nice, as well as with sufficient metadata and descriptions of what's going on. And then download that map. So this GIF is going to take you through the process of that step by step. So first we're going to search for forest integrity areas. We've turned on the forest connectivity layer. You see those areas in the lighter green are those areas that are more important for forest connectivity. We're also going to search for the WDPA. And here we're going to turn on the terrestrial protected areas layer which again is just a subsetting of the World Database on Protected Areas itself. Of course, it's not necessarily turning itself on very quickly here. There we go, finally, it does turn itself on. It is a big database, so sometimes it can be slow to load depending on the number of features that are turning on particularly in somewhere like Peru, where the neighboring country of Brazil has huge numbers of protected areas within it. We can change some of the background colorings as, as well for the maps. So we can change the, the, the grays, um, the backgrounds that differentiate the national boundaries. We can change the color of water if we want to. And here we can also then turn on a satellite view. This is coming in from here maps just so it looks a little bit different. Again, sometimes these things can be a little bit slower to load, but there it goes finally. And we'll turn that off again. It kind of makes it a little bit too cluttered. So we can click on a protected area. We can see what it tells us about that particular area, telling us the name, the designations of it. If it has an IUCN category, as well as we can get the value of the forest connectivity raster underneath that as well. Again, so next we're going to go up to our map composer. We're going to click on that to turn it on. That's going to import our composer space as well as the two data layers that we have turned on. So that's the forest connectivity and the WDPA. And we're going to move the legend icons around. We're going to resize them so that they don't take up huge amounts of space. We're also going to move some of that metadata around. Not all the metadata is necessarily important to maintain within maps. That's, that's important to note. But it is important to maintain attribution to the people that create the data. You don't have to include a description of the data and the data sets in the maps. But it is important and, and good practice to maintain the attribution to the data creators. So here we are just moving things around in the map. Again, there's no set formula for this. This is where you get to be the artist that you always wanted to be. Again, things do kind of click together. They will snap to each other quite nicely. There we go, we've set the data descriptions and the data names next to each other quite separately. And here we have this text that says legend. We're actually just going to move that from the from the template altogether. So it's not even going to show up on the map. We don't really need it to say legend. We just wanted to tell us the IUC and category. So we move those again. We can resize them one more time. And again, we can snap them to make everything kind of line up. We can change the dimensions of it if we want to. And we can then just export our image. There's our, there's our downloaded image with all the boundaries between the legend items removed. That's ready to be put into report, to email to colleagues, put on the website, etc. Let us know how yours turned out.
Awesome. Thanks so much, Scott. So just to wrap up before the end of the webinar, over the past hour or so, we've provided you with an overview of UN Biodiversity Lab, its key features, data available, and we've shown you how to register, search data, run basic analyses, and create your own maps. There are a wide range of ways that you can use the platform to meet your needs, and we're always excited to hear user feedback about what would be useful for you and how you would like to use the platform to support your work. So you can use it to access any of the data layers we have available publicly. You can use it to access or download our NASA Forest Integrity Project data, and you can use it to perform basic analyses to support your work. We're happy to explore different use cases with you or to set up more personalized trainings. Feel free to reach out to us after the webinar and we're happy to discuss more with you. So before we close, I wanna be sure to give a shout out to our great group of partners who are working together to make UN Biodiversity Lab what it is. The platform was created out of a strong partnership working to support countries and their commitments to the CBD and we're continuing to work with this group to explore how we can evolve the site in the future. Within UNDP, we also have a great team supporting this work, led by Jamison Urban, who's the manager of our global program on nature for development. Last week and this week, you've heard from Chrissy and Scott and myself. We also have our colleagues Diego and Marion who are giving the equivalent version of this webinar in Spanish and French and support a wide range of this work. And last but not least, our colleague Prudence Rain supports the implementation of our work around spatial data and UN Biodiversity Lab. And finally, I'd just like to say thank you to all of you for joining us for this second webinar. And please don't hesitate to reach out to us with any questions um, or to go and explore the site more on your own. So with that, I will pass the mic back over to Amber to wrap up the session for today. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Scott and Annie. Uh, really loved the presentation today. It was really great to see more in depth what um, the UN Biodiversity Lab um, tool can do and how to create a map um, really user friendly um, and hopefully will be useful to many of the folks in our audience here. So thanks again for that. A few reminders before we get to um, the question and answer session. So again, I want to thank everyone for being with us here today. We are going to have some time for question and answer, but if we don't get to your question, feel free to email myself or my colleague Juan Torres Perez um, with our emails listed here. If you have general questions about the RCEP program, you can email Anna Prados. And as always, you can visit the RCEP website for the information about this training, but also to find um, other trainings that may be of interest to you um, in water resources or health and air quality. As a reminder, our final session will be um, next week on April 7th, and we're really excited to have some country examples of how they're using UN Biodiversity Lab, and hopefully that'll be relevant to you all who may be interested in applying um, your work to um, the, the, tr the tool as well. So now we all have time for questions. You can enter them into the Q&A box. And um, just a reminder that we're going to post the questions and answers um, in a document on the training website following the conclusion of this course. So we're going to display the um, questions now, but we'll, we'll save all of this and post it later as well. Thank you all. All right, um, so this is Amber McCollum again. Um, give us a moment as we move over to display the question and answer document. Um, a couple of things I wanna mention before we get started. Um, I know that uh, some of you had 
uh, an error when you went to the um, UN Biodiversity Lab that said too many users. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that we'll have the recording available and you can go in and make your map um, and use the recording from this session to go in and do that. Um, uh, pretty cool that we had so many folks using the tool. Um, I also wanted to mention that a lot of you um, provided your names and your uh, locations and your emails, and it's so fantastic to see so many of you from around the world on with us today. Um, if you are interested in contacting any of your colleagues online, um, please do make note of the um, email addresses and the names in that Q&A box. You can copy and paste it yourself. Um, we cannot uh, send out that information at a later date, but we, um, but you can see it all um, here on the, the webinar um, itself. So we're going to move into question and answer. Um, and as we will have for session one, we are going to have the transcript of this available on the website soon. Um, the session one uh, transcript will be available in, in a few days. Um, we're just taking our time going through that and, and making all the necessary edits there. Um, so I will go ahead and hand it over to um, Annie and Scott to start to answer some of these questions. And it looks like question one may be for Scott as it is a um, technical data question. Indeed, sorry, I'm a little bit, uh, a little bit muted there. So the first question is, is how often is the data updated? Um, the answer to that is it depends on the data set. Uh, the, as we mentioned, the WDPA, for example, is updated real time when it's updated by UNEP WCMC, and that, that occurs on a monthly basis. Um, the key biodiversities area data um, is, is another data set that's updated regularly, um, not as regularly as the WDPA. So we, we get that from the KBA partnership when it gets updated. Uh, the global forest cover data is generally updated on an annual basis, um, and other data sets are updated as they uh, as they get updated by the data providers themselves. Generally, the metadata for the layers will describe what the version of the data set is and when it was last updated. If we go on to Question two, how can we use the UN Biodiversity Lab for marine conservation? Um, the questioner notes that they've noticed that marine protected areas from the WDPA are included, but there are huge gaps in the data. Uh, MPA data is, is being pulled in directly from the WDPA, like, like I just mentioned, but it's also important to note that the WDPA itself is only as up to date as the data that they receive from countries that provide it to them. So you have to remember these are the legally defined boundaries as, as provided to WDPA. So it's possible that some areas may not have been submitted to the WDPA or they might be locally managed marine areas that just simply haven't been included. Um, if there are particular areas of, of, of interest or concern to you, we'd certainly be interested in knowing what they are um, and, and trying to explore what some of those huge gaps in the data might be that you're seeing. Great, thanks Scott. This is Annie and I can jump in for question three. So question three says, it was said that UN Biodiversity Lab has only has data for 137 countries, but in the slides it shows data for the whole world. Why? And is it about how much data we can download? So this is a really great question and an important differentiation to make. So I want to stress here that all of the data layers that you see on the public side of the site are global data layers. So we have over 115 global data layers that our team has vetted and reviewed and made available through the site. So these should cover all countries unless there are layers such as mangroves that would only be in countries with coastal areas and ecosystems suitable to mangroves. Um, for all of the data that's available on the public side of the site, it is downloadable based on the restrictions laid out by the original data provider. And you saw during the presentation today how to do this for vector data sets and we can also support you to do this for raster data sets. 
For the 137 countries that we referred to a lot last week, these are the countries that we specifically supported between UNDP and UN Environment to complete their six national reports. So these countries received a wide range of capacity building support and technical reviews as they were developing the six national reports. All 137 countries also have a private national project. So this is within UN Biodiversity Lab and enables them to upload their national level data to a private workspace where they can visualize it and analyze it in combination with the global data layers we have. You don't need one of these private, private projects to access data on UN Biodiversity Lab, but for those countries that we supported, it provided them with a space to add in their own national level data. So if you're working with the UN or government in any of these 137 countries, you can request access to your national project by clicking on the My Projects tab and then scrolling to find your country. If you're working with UN or government outside of these 137 countries, we're happy to set up a national project for you and just send us an email and we can investigate the use case and see how we might be able to support you. So this is a great question and really important to make that differentiation. And I think we have a few questions later on that we'll touch on that as well. So for question four, I think I will hand this one back to you, Scott. All right, so question four is what is proportional range variety? Um, I'm assuming the questioner um, meant to type uh, proportional range rarity. Uh, range rarity metrics are simply measures that combine data on endemism and species richness data. So they're basically indices that lower the contribution of those wide ranging species in an area uh, to the overall species richness metric. And they tend to highlight those areas that have relatively high proportions of narrow range species or, or more endemic species. Um, we can then go on to question five, I suppose. Uh, when will the maps on the human footprint be updated? Um, we're currently in the process of publishing, or, the, or rather the authors of the data, uh, the human footprint, are in the process of publishing those updates. Um, so they're currently limited um, to selected countries who are part of the NASA Forest Integrity Project. Um, we're also in works with the National Geographic Society and some other partners to develop and build out a more streamlined, annualized, and higher resolution a version of the human footprints um, that would be available uh, in near real time updates. Great, I can jump in for question seven here. Um, question seven is, I've tried many times registering but have never received any code. Any suggestions? So easiest suggestion is check your spam folder. The code almost always ends up there. You should receive it within a few minutes of entering your email address on the site. Um, so if you don't and continue to have this issue, please don't hesitate to get in touch with Scott and he can troubleshoot further with you. Scott, you want to question? Yeah. yeah, sorry, I'm just I'm just muted again. <laughs> <laughs> where can we see the where can we see the spatial resolution of each layer and what is the re resolution? Um, if doing ecoregions by biome. Uh, the spatial data resolution is of, of the raster data is, is available in the metadata of the data sets themselves or described in the data descriptions. Uh, the second part of that question, what is the resolution of, of if doing ecoregions by biome? Uh, that's a little bit harder to answer. Biomes are a an even more coarse aggregation of data than the ecoregions are themselves. Um, to actually figure out and what an appropriate estimation of the resolution of those data sets are, I'd have to actually look back into the to the works by um, Dennerstein et al. Um, because I don't know that off the top of my head. All right, question nine: Can we open a, pro a project for a developed OECD country? So yes, this gets back to the same issue as I addressed in question three. 
So we generally prioritize requests for private projects for UN and government users, but we're always open to new use cases. So please don't hesitate to reach out to Scott and myself to explore this. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Next question. Can data layers be exported as shapefiles to open on software such as ArcGIS? The answer is mostly yes. Um, most data, but not all data, can be exported to many standard GIS formats. So those include things like GeoPackage formats, Esri shapefiles, uh, GeoJSONs, SQLite. Um, you can even export some data to CSV. Uh, I say not all data is available to be downloaded um, because we're not allowed to permit downloading of some data sets per our usage agreement with several data providers, um, but most of the data can be downloaded into the standard JS formats and you can open it up in your in your uh, desktop JS. So if you're using ArcGIS or QGIS or Grass or something different. Question 11, can you use the data freely for scientific publications and student theses? Uh, any usage restrictions on the data are noted in the license conditions of the data. Um, they're they're clear within the metadata themselves. Um, I will make a note on that. So even in some cases where the data seems like it has some sort of restriction on it, typically academic use is almost always allowed in all cases, um, following of course the academic tradition of providing full attribution to the data's authors. There are some restrictions in some places where um, data is available for pretty much anything except for commercial usage. Um, but those are small cases and it's all clearly spelled out in the metadata. Question 12 is how do I stay zoomed in to a country or region when changing data sets? Often the screen changes back to the global view when doing this. Uh, we're sorry that you're seeing this right now. We're thinking this might be an issue related to the sheer numbers of people we're seeing on the website right now. Um, if it does something, it is something that continues for the person who asked this question or others who might be having that, we would really appreciate you getting in touch with us and letting us know so we can we can look into it further. Do you want to handle the next question there, Annie, or shall I, do, shall I read that one? Sorry, I was down further in the dock. I'm back at question 13. All right, so question 13 uh, asks, why are there no projects in countries like the U.S.? France, Canada, etc. It seems to be mostly global South Hemisphere countries. Um, so this gets back to question three as well. Uh, the countries that UNDP and UN Environment supported to develop their six national reports are all those countries that are eligible to receive funding from the Global Environment Facility. So this includes 137 developing middle income and small island nations. You can learn more about the Jeff by going to their website. And if you're working in developed countries such as the US, France, or Canada, and are interested in setting up a national project, please don't hesitate to reach out to Scott and myself, and we can work with you to see how to make this happen. Scott, back over to you. So, yeah, I'm, I'm muted again. So what's the difference between applying themes and applying filters in the catalog? Is the theme applied within the chosen data sets and the filter within the catalog list? The themes that you're seeing on the UN Biodiversity Lab landing page are, are, are themes that are larger groupings of data that relate to particular HE biodiversity targets, for example, or projects such as the NADA, NASA Forest Integrity Project or the Nature Map projects. And these are simply front-end collections that are seen on the on the website itself. When you're filtering the data catalog, you're actually filtering data within the database per either the search terms that you supply, so when you type in a word, or you can use one of the defined data collection labels and the advanced filterings. If that's not clear, then please uh, let us know. We can we can follow up with with that question a bit further. Uh, question 15 is what projection are you using to calculate size when creating intersections using the toolbox uh, geodesic um, as with all mapping platforms um, or I should say most web mapping platforms data is is either in a it's, it's in a latitude longitude projection system um, sometimes in a web mercator format um, which if you're going to be doing area calculations on something in latitude longitude you will typically get completely gibberish results because 
two two degrees of area doesn't really mean anything. So typically what will happen and what's what happens in your own biodiversity lab is those calculations are made using the geoids. So that's using the geodesic um, calculations that you mentioned. So what's happening is simply behind the scenes where we have a PostGIS enabled database, those planar geometries, so those geometries that occur on a, on a, on a single two-dimensional space are being cast to geometries and so that, or sorry, to geographies. And so those geometries then take into account the curvature of the earth um, and the fact that the planet itself is not a perfectly round object. So they're much more exact um, than doing things otherwise. Question 16, it says that the platform has exceeded its quota of current users. Uh, what is the limit on concurrent users and is this often a problem? Um, kind of a, a brave new world we're in, finding ourselves in those last few weeks, I think with um, this COVID-19 pandemic. And I think that's really no different than what we're seeing with potentially UN Biodiversity Lab tonight with the sheer numbers of users we're getting. Um, we've, we've never experienced this before. Um, so this is a bit of a stress test to the system. Um, we're certainly gonna make the presentation available after the fact here. Um, and you can do any of the exercises that we've asked you to do on your own over the next week. Um, as, as an actual answer of what the, the quota is of concurrent users, we don't exactly know. Hopefully we're gonna be able to find out um, by looking back at the logs of uh, how many users we've had on the site um, in the last hour. Um, but thank you for breaking our website. Uh, similarly, question seven is somebody saying, I can only use the lab for 20 minutes with the password provided. Any ideas? I uh, would expect this is, again, probably related to the sheer volume of people we're seeing on the site at the moment right now. Uh, however, this does continue. Uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us, including your location and the browser that you're, you're using. And by location, I mean the country um, where you might be accessing us, accessing from. There could be some issues. Um, related to internet speed, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's information we would certainly like to know. Question 18 is asks if it is possible to create inset maps within the map composer. Uh, this is currently not available presently, um, something we're, we're working on and looking at, but it's currently not implemented. It would look very nice though. Awesome. I can take question 19. So this is about the forest connectivity data that is provided through the NASA Forest Integrity Project. And the question is, where do you find forest connectivity on UN Biodiversity Lab? So um, if you can see on the screen, I've inserted a screenshot here. If you, there's a button for Forest Integrity Project on the left-hand bar under Apply Projects. So if you toggle that on, you'll see the forest connectivity layer listed here. And I just want to note um, that this layer is currently only available for countries with humid tropical forests uh, for which the NASA Forest Integrity Project is available. Um, so this is 29 countries with humid tropical forests. And we had a lot of questions about this last week. The project is just focused on this particular biome. So if your country has this biome, the data is available for your country. Um, and we've made, we have the full list of countries that will go out in these notes when they're finalized. And we're happy to take other questions about that as well. Um, I can take question 20 as well to give Scott a little break. Um, so the question is, is there an opportunity to download global data? So yes, this is what Scott showed during his presentation. You can easily download any of the vector data sets that are available on the site, as long as the use restrictions from the data provider allow this. Download, downloading raster data sets is a little bit more complicated, um, but we're happy to help you do this. Just contact Scott and he can walk you through the process. And it looks like Amber is actually working on question 21 and might have some information about that one. So maybe I'll turn it over to you here. Great, thanks Annie. Yes, um, the question for question 21 is, I'm working on the use of remote sensing data and terrestrial data to assess the impact of indoor and outdoor thermal conditions. Is there available data for this? Um, so I've linked to uh, Landsat. Um, this was 
a, a similar question was asked last week. Um, so please do come back. There may be a little bit more information on the um, week one Q&A, but Landsat has a thermal band and it's been used to monitor things like um, urban heat islands, um, as well as um, MODIS, I believe also has a temperature signature. Um, but this is, again, uh, we have to think about the spatial resolution here. So Landsat has a 30 meter spatial resolution. Um, so that's really not going to be ideal for monitoring any sort of indoor thermal conditions. Um, however, if you're looking at larger regions, um, landscape scale, um, the thermal data can be used. Um, it's oftentimes used um, in conjunction with other information um, related to drought. So if that is something you're interested in, um, looking at thermal anomalies as well as uh, precipitation anomalies can help you assess things like that as well. Um, but again, it's oftentimes this trade-off of, of spatial resolution. So question 22 looks a little similar. Uh, and the Landsat information can be used to address the thermal. Um, and then there may be some other, <laughs> Annie and Scott may have some additional um, comments on the rest of it, so I can read it. Um, I'm working on the use of remote sensing data and terrestrial data to assess the impact of indoor and outdoor thermal condition, Melania City in the Philippines, um, data such as population, land surface temperature, urban change and expansion, and water and energy consumption. Um, so beyond the Landsat data for th um, the thermal uh, information, we also discussed uh, the VIRS sensor um, on board a Suomi NPP, and that is um, often used for night lights. And there's this beautiful map of um, global night lights uh, via the, the VIRS data. And this is often used to assess population and urban extent. So that might be another data set that you can look into. And I can provide the link to that here. And we covered it in the first session as well. Uh, and one other thing, sorry, <laughs> before we move on, um, the urban change and expansion we also um, had a webinar last year uh, highlighting the trends.earth tool, which was created by Conservation International. And during the final session, I believe the third session of that training, we highlighted the urban mapper. And that is um, the, the trends.earth tool is a feature, a plugin for QGIS. But there's also a, a web tool available with that um, for the urban portion. Um, and you can use that to monitor um, change in urban extent. Um, so do visit the RSET website. Well, I'll find the link and put that in the document too. But the RSET website, um, you can view that information and get the, the link to the urban mapper for looking at urban change and expansion as well. And then I think I will hand it back over to um, Scott likely for question 23. Sure thing. Um, so are there and which satellite imagery are available on UN Biodiversity Lab? So if you were able to get the, the platform working for you, if you weren't thrown off, um, we offer satellite base maps, both from um, here maps and Bing. Uh, so the satellite data that you're seeing in there are simply those those RGB, those red, green, red, green, blue base layers, tiles of the satellite data themselves. They're not the, the useful multispectral remotely sensed imagery that you might be thinking about when you're thinking about useful satellite imagery for remote sensing analyses. And so in most cases, you can, you can access most of these same data layers uh, in a desktop GIS software. So for example, in QGIS, for example, um, you can pull in those those same tiles. Um, you can also pull them in from from Google's satellite array. Um, but this data 
isn't the multispectral stuff that you're going to be able to calculate um, NDVI from or do other types of analyses like that. Um, and typically when I say you can access these, these data layers from uh, your own desktop JIS software, that normally assumes they're using them in kind of a normal usage allocation. So those, those can happen within a, a free allocation amount. Um, you can pull in that data as well from Mapbox, for example, within a free allocation amount. But if you're using high amounts of, of, of tile requests on, on those services, they will typically then start uh, requiring and asking for a fee per use. Uh, it's not typically expensive, but you generally don't probably want to pay that. Um, we do have a, a fee per use um, agreement with our data users simply because we do pull in more tiles than, than a standard typical user would do. Awesome. I can take question 24. So this question is, is it possible to download the raw data instead of just the maps so it can be combined with your own data? And the answer is yes. Um, I do want to differentiate. So all of the data sets on UN Biodiversity Lab are derived from raw satellite data, um, but those composite data sets are all available on UN Biodiversity Lab, and they're available for download if it's allowed by the original data provider. So to download the vector data sets, you can follow the process that Scott introduced in his presentation, and we'll also be sharing that presentation after. And to download raster data sets, we can help you to do this, or rather, by we, I mean Scott can help you to do this. <laughs> so just send him an email with the data sets that you're interested in. Question 25, I can also take. The question is, what are the options for using UN Biodiversity Lab when there's no internet? So unfortunately, using the platform does require an internet connection. The site is optimized for a low bandwidth connection, but it does still require an active internet connection. Um, one option around this would be if you have desktop GIS software on your computer. In that case, you could download data layers of interest and then continue to work with them offline using your GIS um, desktop software. So for question 26, I will turn it back over to Scott. All right, question 26. I am wondering how we can use the UN Biodiversity Lab to create a map that shows the trace impacts of environmental of tobacco production in Zimbabwe. Farmers mainly use fuel wood for tobacco processing. Um, it might be a little bit more difficult to get down to the scales at which that tobacco production of farming might be occurring uh, within, within Zimbabwe with, without knowing more about it uh, myself. But a relevance to that is probably going to be data that looks at things like forest loss or, or human encroachment into areas. So I'd be looking at things like the global forest cover data sets. Um, some of you might know those as the Hansen data. Um, and that would just be simply being to looking at at areas where maybe forest cover has, has been reduced uh, and areas where we know that, that tobacco production has been going on. Um, I'm saying all this without having any idea of, of what the environmental impacts of tobacco production are, if it's the kind of thing that does entail forest clearing, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but also it might be useful to look at things like some of the human footprint metrics, so human footprint change. Um, of course, I, I mentioned earlier that the scale of those might be a, a little bit inappropriate, but I would probably think that the two most relevant um, useful data sets for you would be uh, probably human footprint and and forest cover. Um, happy to discuss that further though if, if, if you'd like. Great, thank you so, Scott and Annie. Um, this is Amber again. I think we're going to um, end with the question and answer session there. Um, we're right up um, at the half hour mark and the end of the uh, webinar for today. Um, we will go ahead and address the rest of these questions via text, and please do come back to the course website. Um, within about a week or so, we should have the um, question and answer document for sessions one and two posted. Um, I want to thank you all again for being with us today, um, and do please come back for our final session next week at the same time. 
um, we're going to hear from some country representatives and really get their perspective on um, their use of the tool and these data sets for um, biodiversity and conservation. So um, thank you again, everyone, and uh, please do join us next week. Again, if you had issues with the website today, um, feel free to visit it again um, on your own time. And within the next couple of days, we'll have the recording of this session available on our website and uh, via YouTube. So you can come back to it and go through all the steps that Scott highlighted for us today. Um, so thank you all and have a great day.